Hello friends, it's Reverend Kevin Livingston and this is the last Sunday when I'll be away on holiday. This is actually a picture from earlier in the year when Irene and I went to the conference of the Latin America Mission in Colombia. We are so looking forward to being with you again and worshiping and sharing with you. But today I want to share a wonderful sermon that I heard by Pastor Matthew Rattan where he speaks about praying and not giving up which is what Jesus tells us to do in Luke chapter 18. Matthew is the pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church in Barrie, and I'm sure you'll appreciate what he has to say. Blessings and see you soon, dear friends. Bye-bye. Ethelfrith was a... Um, it was a pagan Saxon king in the 600s who invaded Wales. Invaded Wales and the Welsh people were Christians and he's there and he's, and he's got, you know, his people and his army and he's about to, you know, engage in battle. You know, he's already coming to the land about, you know, on the Welsh people. And he notices this clump of people who are unarmed, this clump of men who are unarmed. And he's like, what are they doing? It's strange because we're about to engage in battle. So what's going on here? And so he asks someone who they are and someone brings back a report. Oh, those are the Christian monks of Bangor. And they're praying to God to give, uh, you know, success to the Welsh people. Praying to God, they're unarmed. And so what does Athelfrith do? What does he do? Well, does he say, okay, no, they don't matter, right? He actually says this. He says, attack them first. Attack them first. Now, why would he say that? I just think that's very telling. He, he, he's so concerned that prayer is that powerful and effective that he considers them to be more dangerous than the people in the battlefield, the warriors with physical weapons. And my question for us is, do we also consider prayer to be that powerful and that effective? Now, on the surface, we all agree that prayer is very important, right? We know that it's important, and we know what the Scripture says about prayers. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. Jesus teaches us to pray all these things, right? We know that. And we also know that there's great Christian heroes throughout history who have said wonderful and inspiring things about the centrality of prayer. Here are a couple of them. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. What about uh, the late... Uh, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, who says that prayer is the sweetest work of the soul. Sweetest work of the soul. So what do we feel? How do we respond when we hear things like that? Are we inspired? Or do we kind of feel guilty? Because we know that prayer is important, but we struggle with it. And sometimes maybe we even question it. And as I've talked to people, I've got the sense that people are really kind of in, in three categories in their prayer life right now. Let me say the three of them, and maybe you can identify which one you fall into. So over here, there's maybe people who are like, doing really well. I'm doing really well with my prayer life, Matthew. And in fact, some people, COVID-19 has actually focused their prayer life and given them new energy and zeal. Maybe there's a second group, and they're like, it's fine. It's fine. It's been better. It's been worse. It's fine. And then there's this other third category. Think, you know, I'm not doing very well with my prayer life and maybe feel like giving up and question whether or not it makes any difference. Well, there's good news is that Jesus has wisdom and counsel and help to encourage us. And so that's what we're going to explore today through the parable of the persistent widow, it's called, uh, in Luke 18, verses 1 to eight. And we actually have someone special who's going to read that scripture for us. Not yet. I'll introduce them shortly. But I want to give some background to the gospel of Luke so that we all can kind of hit the ground running. So, of course, it's in scripture. So the Bible is the primary place where we learn about God's will. We want to know God's will for our lives and in his wisdom and his counsel and his help. It's such a beautiful gift that we have scripture. Like, how much does God care for us? That, that we have this, this, this wisdom and this, this teaching to help us through the valleys and mountains and all the different chapters of life. He's given us this love letter to us that's applicable for, for all people through all times and backgrounds. It's a great, incredible gift for us. And so Luke is in the New Testament. It's one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So these are the stories of and about Jesus. It's written by Luke who was a companion of the Apostle Paul. He was a doctor, so very, a learned person. Um, and also, one of the great things about the Gospel of Luke is that right in the first chapter, he tells us about you know, how he went about writing it and his kind of approach to things. So it says that he goes about finding eyewitness testimony. Uh, also, he, he wants to write an orderly account. It says that in chapter 1. And he also writes it for a person named Theophilus. And he says that the purpose of his writing is, is so that you may have certainty in the things you have been taught about Jesus. 
So that's great. So for people then and also for people now, it's to increase the certainty about what we've been taught about Jesus from eyewitness testimony, and it's an orderly account. Okay, so as you read through the gospel, you'll find that there's certain themes that Luke really stresses. Now, one of those themes is that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, not just for the Jewish people, but for everyone. He's the savior of the whole world, to anyone, regardless of the background, anyone who believes. So that's incredible good news, and he emphasizes the importance of that. Another theme is the Holy Spirit. You'll find the Holy Spirit comes a lot, up a lot in Luke's gospel. So the Holy Spirit, this positive impact on believers, God working in and through us, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Also, prayer comes up a lot. Prayer is a real focus. And so this week, preparing for this message, I went through and highlighted all the different places where prayer comes out. Let me just highlight them for you. When the birth of John the Baptist is foretold, all the people are praying, chapter 1. After his baptism, Jesus was praying when the Holy Spirit descended on him, chapter 3. He heads off on his own alone to pray, chapter 5 and 9 and 22. He sometimes spends all night in prayer, chapter 6. He teaches us to pray for those who mistreat us, chapter 6. He prays with his disciples, chapter 9. As Jesus is praying, his appearance changes, and Moses and Elijah come to talk to him, chapter 9. He teaches his disciples the Lord's prayer, which is an example about how to pray and what to pray for, Luke 11. He teaches to be persistent in prayer, how our Father in heaven cares about us and how we are given the Holy Spirit, Luke 11. He teaches us to always pray and not give up. That's today's parable, chapter 18. He teaches that we are justified and exalted before God when we pray humbly and for forgiveness for our sin, Luke 18. He warns against saying fancy prayers just for show, chapter 20. Before his betrayal and crucifixion, he tells his disciples to pray to not be tempted, chapter 22, verses 40 and 46. He prays fervently on the Mount of Olives, his sweat coming down like drops of blood, chapter 22. That's a lot of prayer. Now, part of what makes this parable specifically uh, really special to us is, is that it only appears here in the Gospel of Luke. It doesn't come up in Matthew or, or Mark or John, and it comes right after a teaching about Jesus' return. So keep in mind, because that kind of figures into our interpretation of it. So to take us through the text, uh, before I offer a word of explanation, is Charlotte Taylor. And so Charlotte's one of our younger members here at the church, but I was thinking this week, I remember this video that her mom, Sue, posted uh, about Charlotte memorizing uh, uh, the Apostles' Creed. I was so impressed with that. I thought she did such a good job. I thought, I wonder if she'd like to lead God's people in, in the scriptures, in the, in the Word. And so I reached out to Sue, and so she checked with Charlotte, and she was enthusiastic to do it. She does a great job. So let's follow along with the text. Take it away, Charlotte. Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray, not give up. He said in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with, a pl with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God, or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't even eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge Judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, then the Son of Man comes, when the Son of Man comes, 
will he find faith on the earth? Great job, Charlotte. Thank you so much. You did such a good job. And just know that uh, as you read that, you're leading God's people uh, in worship and you're reading his word to us. So thank you so much for blessing us. You did a great job. And Sue, thank you so much for setting it up. So let's go through the text and highlight some things. If you have your Bibles and you want to open them to Luke 18, I encourage you to do so. Now, don't be afraid to take some notes. Uh, I'm following along with the New International Version here. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable. Okay, so what's a parable? Well, a parable is a story or an illustration taken from daily life. So some sort of story or illustration we can relate to. Uh, and according to English scholar C.H. Dodd, it's meant to tease our minds into active thought. So the idea is that because it's a story or illustration that we can relate to, um, it, it kind of brings our thinking to a new level and a new learning about God. So he teaches them a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So that's key. Always pray and not give up. So quite often at the start of Jesus' parables, he doesn't, he doesn't usually, uh, or very often anyway, tell us what the point of the parable is. But here he has mercy on us and says, hey, this is what this is about. Always pray and not give up. So if you walk away from this message, you're like, okay, I should always pray and not give up. You will have done well. Now think about it. Why would he tell a, a message like that? Well, it's probably because his disciples are there and some of them aren't always praying and some of them feel like giving up. And so this is a great encouragement and help, not only for them then, but for us now, especially for those who maybe aren't that consistent in their prayer life and who feel like maybe they should kind of give up. Verse 2, he said, in a certain town, there was a judge. So we don't know if this is a historical thing that he's referring to or if he makes it up. It doesn't really matter. He's using this story to highlight the point about always praying and not giving up. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Okay, so basically, he's totally ill-equipped to be a judge. This is like the worst possible. He doesn't fear, doesn't respect God, and he doesn't even care about people. Uh, it's interesting, in the Old Testament, in 2 Chronicles 19, uh, beginning at verse 5, we learn about King Jehoshaphat, who actually uh, appoints some judges in the land. And this is the example of what a judge should be like, okay? He appointed judges in the land in each of the fortified cities of Judah, he told them, consider carefully what you do because you are not judging for mere mortals, but for the Lord who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully for with the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Like that's the definition of a good judge, right? And this guy in, in, in Luke 18 is the opposite of that. Doesn't care what people thought. Verse three, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him. With a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. So we don't know what the plea specifically was. We don't know who the adversary is, but it's a widow who comes. Now think of this, it's a widow. So quite often today we think, okay, a, widow, uh, you know, a, a, a husband has passed away or has, has died or maybe been killed to some degree. So we think maybe this is, you know, in many situations, a widow might be older. It's not necessarily the case. In the first century, many people uh, died in their 30s. It was much more common then than now. So, you know, we don't really know her age. But here's another historical insight that might, give us a bit of an interpretive key. So in the first century, it was not customary for a woman to represent herself in a court of law or before a judge. So she would have had her husband, but in this case, her husband's not around. So maybe a father or a brother or a close cousin or something. She's, she's, she's doing it herself. So the assumption that I have is that she is actually alone. She doesn't have someone to be there with her and supporting her in this case. So she's a widow and there's no social supports. There's no social systems that are going to help her. So you know, it, it's like a life or death situation for widows quite often. And she doesn't have these uh, other people in her family with her. So she really is alone. Verse 4, for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now, the Greek here is like, so, so I won't get a black eye from her coming. Like, she, she's so persistent, right? And the Lord said, so Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. So what he has just said, okay? And then Jesus in verse 7 goes on to offer the explanation. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is yes. So our understanding of that verse is this, God does bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Okay, so here it's interesting also, the widow is paralleled with chosen ones, meaning the elect or God's people as followers of Jesus. So God will bring about justice for his people who cry out to him day and night. And see the persistence is, is the theme there. Will he keep putting them off? And again, the answer is no. 
I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So he will respond. He will deliver justice and quickly. Now, when we read that verse, some people think, well, you know what? I I want God to bring justice in my life. I want God to bring good in my life. However, I'm not seeing it quickly. Well, we have to remember that sometimes we can see and experience God responding to our prayers and bringing justice and goodness, but sometimes we can't, right? But we have to remember that God works on a bit of a different timetable than us. Remember what we were reminded in 2 Peter 3, 8, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, right? Final verse says this, however, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, what does that mean? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That seems a bit disjointed. Well, here's what I think is going on here. So who is the Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man is Jesus. Now, but some people think that, okay, the Son of Man, that's just an allusion to his humanity, that he's a human, he's born of Mary. Well, it is that to a degree, but it's also a title, and it's a frequent title, the most frequent title that Jesus applies to himself. But it's also an allusion to Daniel chapter 7. So we recall Daniel in the Old Testament, you know, Daniel, you know, in the lion den, Daniel. Well, he has this vision in chapter 7 of Daniel, and here's what it is. In verses 13 and 14, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with someone who appears as a human, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion, kingdom, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. End quote. Okay, so this is a significant statement. This is who Jesus understands himself to be. Okay? So, given that, what he's saying is that he will one day return in all sovereign glory, and everyone will see his splendor. People will worship him. Okay, so he will return, and he will bring in an eternal kingdom. So what Jesus is saying is when he returns like that... Will he find faith on the earth when he comes back? And specifically, because he's just told us this parable, will he find the faith of the persistent widow in us when he returns? Will he find us as his people when he returns to be always praying and not giving up? Or will he not? Okay, so we'll end the text there. Uh, This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so in these strange and uncertain days when we're struggling with our prayer life, perhaps, and i saying to always pray and not give up, uh, let's offer some more um, a specific uh, advice based on what we read in the text. And here's the first one. Lay bare your struggle and need before God. Lay bare your struggle and need before God. I think this is a part of the teaching of this parable because Jesus has chosen a widow. She has no illusion of her own strength, no illusion of her own self-sufficiency. Sufficiency. She's alone. She's desperate. Lay bare your struggle and your need before God. See, when we pray as a first resort and not just as a last resort, what we're saying is that, God, I need your strength because it's greater than my own. I need your wisdom and knowledge because it's greater than my own. So we lay, we we don't have to come to God with all these fancy words and have it all together and God's only going to listen to us if we just, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's in our lives. Lay bare your struggle. Be honest before God. But this is hard for us in North America because we have degrees and we, you know, some food in the fridge and we keep our grass cut usually. You know, we have the illusion of control. We think we're doing better than we are. We think we're wiser than we are. We think we're stronger than we are. But we need to lay bare our struggles. Uh, Lee Strobel is in The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel. He wrote a book called The Case for Miracles. And in it, he's talking about this very thing. And he, uh, he interviews a man named Roger Olson, who's a professor of ethics, who says this. The more prosperous and educated we are, the more likely we are to substitute our own cleverness and accomplishments for the power of prayer. That's the seductive power of prosperity. It makes us less reliant on God. We think we've got everything under control. Hmm. We don't. Number two, trust that God is good and that God responds. Trust that God is, in fact, good and that God responds. You know, I think this is a faith issue. Quite often when we're struggling with prayer, and I realize that we go through tough patches, but it's a faith issue. We sometimes think maybe maybe God isn't good and maybe God doesn't actually respond. Uh, In a sermon on prayer uh, back in 1990 at Redeemer Church in New York City, Tim Keller uh, says this. He says, doubt is a form of spiritual vertigo, spiritual vertigo or dizziness. Doubt is a form of spiritual vertigo where your heart spiritually can't process something you see. So what happens is we see and experience certain things. 
Like, okay, I, I know in my head that God is good, but then I see things in, in, in the world where it doesn't seem that God is good or that God cares, and that's doubt. This spiritual vertigo or dizziness, it just, what we're seeing and experiencing isn't matching up with what we claim to believe, right? Or then we're praying about something and we don't see or perceive God responding at all, and we think, okay, maybe God isn't actually there. We've got this spiritual dizziness or vertigo, and that's a doubt. So really, this is about a faith issue. But friends, let me tell you this. Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean that God isn't doing something. Just because you can't see and perceive the wisdom and power and almightiness of God doesn't mean it isn't there. It just means that we are finite and smaller in our experience of life and in our minds. It's like that old analogy between the ant and the Is the ant always going to understand Einstein's mathematics? No, because Einstein is Einstein and the ant is the ant. Well, we're the ant and God is God. And so we trust that God is good and that God responds Right? God is disposed to us like this caring parent. Jesus teaches us to, to think of God as a heavenly father, this perfect father. And this comes across beautifully in a book on prayer. And this is a classic prayer book. And so some of the, the language might be a bit challenging, but it's, this, it's called With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray. And he talks about how God is good in response because God is this one who so cares for us more than anyone else on earth. And this is how he describes it. He says this, the father, God, listens in all the compassion with which a father listens to a weak or sickly child. In all the joy with which he hears a stammering child. In all the patience with which he tolerates a thoughtless child. That is the God who hears and responds and is good in response to us. See, it's interesting. In this parable of the, of the widow, um, it's called, uh, the teaching lesson, the format is called lesser, the, the lesser to the greater argument. So the idea is, is if this unjust judge will actually respond and bring justice to this widow, how much more, in the greater example, how much more is God, who is infinitely more just and good and wonderful and caring towards us, how much more will he respond to the people he made and the people he loves? He will. Number three, don't give up. Don't give up. My friends, be persistent like the widow. She is persistent. When we pray as a first resort and not just as a last resort, what we're saying is that we need God. We're, we're lost without God. There's no way that we, by virtue of our own cleverness or our own goodness or, we can, we, or our own strength that we can figure stuff out. We are coming to God because we are acknowledging when we pray as a first resort, not a last, last resort, that we totally need him and his assistance. Uh, Fred Craddock tells a story about uh, a large gathering of people in this community. They come together because there's this social injustice and they wanted to talk about this and voice their concerns about this oppression that was going on. And this one man got up uh, to, to share some thoughts and he was a, an elderly black man and he was a retired uh, pastor. And he got up in the group in this commentary against this issue, he, he actually gets up and he opens his Bible. He opens to Luke 18. He reads this exact same story, the parable of the persistent widow. And then he offers this commentary. This is all, this is everything he said. He said, until you have stood for years, knocking at a locked door, your knuckles bleeding, you do not really know what prayer is. <laughs> persistence, persistence, persistence. Don't give up as we call upon our God who is loving and sovereign and almighty, working through everyday affairs, the affairs and events of his people. Okay, number four. I just want to offer some tips for when you're struggling. Okay, so I said that I was preparing for this, that I would share some just very practical tips. And these are things that I've found to be helpful over the years because I want to encourage you, right? Not just in a theoretical way, but offer you some practical resources for you if you want to up your prayer life, okay? The first is this. Remember that what Jesus says about prayer. Always pray and don't give up. That's, that's the point of this. He says it. Always pray and don't give up. And get this. So in John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. So the reason why I think that's important is because a sign of our love for Jesus, a sign of our devotion to Jesus is always praying and don't give up. It's not just about, well, about us. It's about him and our devotion to him. Another one, schedule times to pray. Sometimes people struggle. Their, 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 their calendars are all over the place. And so you can look at the week ahead and you can schedule some actual times to pray. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe it's in the evening. Maybe it's a break between classes or a break at work, whatever it happens to be. Schedule time. That can be helpful. Uh, pray at meals. So I know a lot of you, hopefully you do pray and you say grace at mealtime. 
Um, I think you should pray at all, all meals, by the way. But also, since you're there, since you're praying, maybe you're alone, maybe you're with a group of people, use that opportunity that you're already there together. Use that as an opportunity to pray for more things. You're there together. Why not seize that moment? So maybe you know so-and-so is battling with cancer or so-and-so has got a big decision to make or so-and-so has got this worry on their plate. Whatever it happens to be, use that moment to pray. Make a list. Some people wander. They're fine. I just, I'm so scattered. Make a list. So I've got things that I always pray for on Tuesdays, other things that I always pray for on Wednesdays or Thursdays. And there's other things that come up, but there's this list. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like, oh, right. I want to keep these petitions always before God. I want to be praying for them. Another thing is pray with a partner. That can be helpful. So maybe uh, you just need that accountability. You need to be tethered to another person to kind of uh, bolster your prayer life. And so maybe, hey, let's, let's talk on Thursday evenings or let's talk on Wednesdays at noon and, and pray over the phone together, right? I've got my prayer part. I, I pray with my family, of course, and I pray you know, for concerns here in the church in the wider world. We've got a prayer partner. We, every month we Zoom together and we, we pray. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says to pray this, so it's a good idea because he says so. Uh, but it's, it's this amazing mission statement for life on earth uh, that Jesus tells us. But however, when we say the Lord's Prayer, as we do every Sunday in worship, sometimes, you know, it can become rote because you've memorized it. And so you're not actually thinking of it. You're, you're, you're verbally saying things. Stuff's coming out of your mouth, but you're thinking about the laundry or that bill you need to pay. And so say it slowly. Slow it down. Just go through and think of each petition as it goes through. Another idea, lastly, that I'll put up there that I've personally found really useful is praying through the Psalms. And so my devotional life, I'm always going through the Bible, I'm always going through the Gospel and Acts, and I'm always going through the Psalms to pray them. And so what that means is that, you know, Psalm 1, you open it up, there's the first couple lines, just pause after a couple verses and pray based on what you've read, right? And so maybe there's a couple lines in one of David's Psalms about him confessing his sins. Well, confess yours. Then him praising God, you know, for how good God is. Then take a moment to do that yourself in your own words. Maybe it's some struggle or whatever. Just pray based on what you see happening in the Psalms, a couple of verses at a time. It could be a really great way to tether yourself in your prayer life uh, to something solid which is um, rooted in the Scriptures. So that can be very helpful as well. So let me just end with this simple analogy. I've got a light bulb here. Here it is. I'll pull it up here. Something from home. Okay. Light. Here's the thing. Today we've been talking about prayer. Always pray and don't give up. And I've been saying that we should always pray and not give up. We should lay bare our struggles and needs before God. I've been saying we should trust that God is good and that God responds and that we should not give up, right? When you don't do those things, this is you. When you don't do those things. But when you do do those things, you're, you're laying bare your struggles and your need before God with honesty. When you're trusting that God is good and that God responds. When you don't give up, this is you. Light goes on, right? And light is such a great... Metaphor for so many things, light shines and it radiates. It's got this energy called electricity and light that's running through it, right? And so what, what happens with our prayer life? Would we rather the light be off when we're not actually laying bare our struggles before God, when we're not trusting him or that he responds or when we're really easy to give up? Do we want to be this or do we want to be this? I think we should be this. What do we want to be? Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? My friends, always pray and don't give up. When Jesus comes, will he find that type of faith, the faith of the persistent widow in you and in me? Amen.